truth is not, it just isn't important today. And in case you didn't hear that and understand it, let me reemphasize it. Truth is not important today and in today's world. Now let's discuss that for a few minutes. The philosophy of this world primarily is, at least the prevailing philosophy, is postmodernism. One individual wrote to define it, talking about postmodernism, to define, to define it would violate the postmodernist premise that no definite terms, boundaries, or absolute truths exist. So if you want a definition of postmodernism, uh, you're barking up the wrong tree because there's no way to define it. <coughs> and anything that you might define it with might mean something totally different to the person who you're defining it to. An ancient writer and scholar uh, by the name of Brother Dub McClish, <laughs> wrote, quote, it gives moral equivalence to all philosophies, political systems, ethical systems, and religions. In this diabolical and irrational scheme of relativism, all truth claims are counted equal. There is no such thing as objective, immutable, absolute truth. Whatever one believes or thinks is one's truth, but directly contradicts beliefs and thoughts that are no less truth." End quote. And he is right in setting forth that idea of what postmodernism is. As I said, it is primarily the prevailing thinking of our day. And thus, we hear and almost seemingly without contradiction, and some have used this in previous lessons, individuals speaking of my truth or that's your truth because whatever their thought is, is truth to them. Whatever I think is truth is truth to me. Even though those two ideas that might be being expressed are totally opposite and contradictory to one another. It's still, well, that's your truth and this is my truth. Certainly truth, if we're looking at it from a political standpoint, does not matter. To our politicians today, whatever is it politically expedient at the specific time they say it is all that matters to them. And that's what they're going to say. I think a good illustration of that is what we keep hearing today. But before we get to today, let's go back a few years. When I was younger, Growing up, there were some men who came along and said, we're going to enter into another ice age. Half of the United States is going to be under ice because of this ice age. Well, that didn't work out too well for them. So these same individuals later on come up with global warming. And now then, you know, unless we change everything, we're all going to burn up because of global warming. Now, 
I think some people up north might be wishing for a little bit more global warming right now. But again, it was basically the same people who before were saying that we were going to have an ice age. But again, the facts don't quite bear out this idea of global warming. And so what do these same individuals do? Well, it's global change now. I'm kind of grateful for the global change, at least in this area, from yesterday to today. I'm glad we have change from morning or from the day to the night. Now, how many of you are going to disagree with change? We have change all the time in our climate, don't we? Well, that's not, of course, what they mean because it's not politically expedient, but how can you argue against global change that things are going to change? It's going to get colder, it's going to get warmer, and both of it is the result of the same thing. You see, it was politically expedient to claim an ice age it became politically expedient for them to claim global warming. And now then it's politically expedient for them to say climate change. Truth of the matter doesn't matter to them. Truth wasn't important. Another illustration. I know that the people of this area and across the southern border are very interested in having a wall being built. And yet we've got a group of individuals who at one time were saying, we need to build a wall across the southern border. But now then those exact, exact same individuals who at one time were saying we need a wall are now saying, we don't need a wall. And in fact, building a wall is immoral as they speak behind their walled houses and yards. Truth doesn't matter to them. It was politically expedient at that time to say we need the wall. And now then, in reality, because of their Trump derangement syndrome, they say, we don't need a wall, and it's immoral. Ask them to tear down the walls around their houses if it's immoral. They don't care about truth. It means nothing to them. It's what is politically expedient for them at the time. But lest you think I'm only picking on the Democrats, I mean, demon rat, I'll get it right sooner or later, Democrats. <clears throat> what about those Republicans? Well, they're angels, right? They're so good and honorable. A few years ago, 2010, in fact, the Republicans, to a man, opposed the raising of a debt limit. The Democrats were in control of the Senate, had 55 votes. Problem is, they needed 60 in order to raise the debt limit. The Republicans and the Republican leadership asked every senator to join with the Democrats in passing a threshold that would lower the 60 vote necessary to 50 votes. Now, why would they do that? Because then it can be passed, because Democrats had 55 votes, and they can go home and they can tell their constituents, we voted against that raising the debt limit. We were opposed to it. Ted Cruz, in his 
book, A Time for Truth, in the introduction to that book, cited this, and then he says this, quote, this way we could all, or we could return home and tell the voters that we had opposed raising the debt ceiling right after consenting to let it happen, end quote. Honesty? Psst, I didn't care about what's truth and what's right and what's honest. Didn't have any concern at all for it. Truth wasn't important to them. The only thing that was important to them is what they could tell their voters back home to get reelected so that they could retain their power. From a political standpoint today, political party and the alliance to that political party and the power that comes with it is all that matters to our politicians. But you say, well, morally, surely truth matters, does it? Look at the sad state of marriage in our society, the home within our society. Consider just the live-in arrangements. Now, so many people today forego marriage for just living together. We'll just live together for a little while, and if we like each other and everything works out and hunky-dory, we'll just keep living together because we don't need a piece of paper that says we're married, do we? Truth about marriage and the home just doesn't matter to them. Fornication, find someone today that enters into a marriage relationship who is a virgin, whether you're dealing with men or women, doesn't matter. Very rare. Why? Because it is almost expected in relationship to committing fornication all the way down to middle school kids. And there's nothing wrong with it, apparently, because truth doesn't matter. Homosexuality, of course, why well, it doesn't really matter, does it, as far as what the truth is. It's simply an alternate lifestyle. And as I believe Brother Moses pointed out, their agenda was never simply equality. They have to have you accepting what they are doing. And it's worked within our society. Stand out and start opposing homosexuality. See what happens to you. You're going to be attacked by just about everybody. Why? Because you cannot do that. Truth doesn't matter about it. And by the way, we are sometimes aghast at pedophilia. Pedophilia is following the exact same plan that the homosexuality group followed. And every argument that the homosexuals made, the pedophiles are going to make. What about the truth of it? Doesn't matter. See, from a moral standpoint, look at the immodesty in our society. Pornography, <laughs> some people don't have any concept of what pornography is. Uh, I can remember many years ago, people saying, well, Playboy, that's not pornographic. What is it then? Well, it's a good newspaper, right. You see, that type and the depicting of naked people and that's physically naked and naked not according to God's standard didn't matter to them if you want to deal with nakedness according to God's standard <laughs> you start advocating that and you have even members of the church looking at you like you're some kind of a, type of a nut 
Surely you don't expect women to dress like that in our society today. Remember a preacher several years ago saying that whatever the typical clothing is in a place in which you go, that's the way that is modest. Go to the beach, and if they're in their string bikinis, that's the, what is modest. And thus, if you should go fully clothed there, why, that's immodest. And that was preaching the Lord's church. We could just continue on. Want to talk about language today? <laughs> now, you go back prior to that one movie, Gone with the Wind, in which Rhett Butler made that famous statement. And you hear that on television today, and <laughs> that's mild. And yet people at that time were amazed that something like that would even be said allowed to be said on movie. The language of our society is immoral, filthy communication that continues to take God's name in vain. And how many members of the Lord's church will continue to say things like, oh my God, and think nothing about it? Gosh, golly. G, G whiz, and all of the other list and taking God's name that just another name for God, using it in a profane way. When I get in trouble with our brethren even, talk about drunkenness. And if you take one drink, you're one drink drunk. No, it's just drunkenness. Drinking by itself, there's nothing wrong with that. You see, truth doesn't matter, not even to our brethren. Religiously, truth doesn't matter. Start to, uh, start a discussion with the denominational world regarding mechanical instruments and music and see if truth matters. Doesn't matter to them, they don't care. They're going to have their idol, and we recognize this when we, there was the division with the Christian church. They were going to have their idol no matter what. Their idol became the mechanical instrument of music. Truth didn't matter. They were going to have it. Baptism for remission of sins, and that one must know what it's for, doesn't matter to people. You can't expect people to be baptized in water. Well, what about this person who dies on the way to the baptistry? You going to say that that individual is lost? What does the Bible say it takes to be saved? How dare you condemn my, my family to hell? No, what does the Bible say? doesn't matter what the Bible says. The only thing that matters is their feelings and their emotions. Now today, isn't that in reality why Pentecostalism is so popular in our society? Because the only thing that matters to them is their emotions, their feelings, and they get all built up by the emotionalism that is seen within their religious groups. And that's enough for them. Truth of the matter does not matter. Truth doesn't matter to them. And we see the same things taking place even in the Lord's church. The same principles. Does truth really matter to the Lord's church nowadays? Start dealing with some of the practices that we see in the Lord's church today and asking where is God's authority for this practice? They don't even consider it. They've never considered such a question. Why? Because in reality, truth doesn't matter. They are more following tradition and allowing the 
whoever it is, going to change these practices without ever even thinking about God's word. Because in reality, truth doesn't matter. Talk about how to live the Christian life, leaving this building. How many even faithful members of the Lord's church does truth really matter? As you consider what you do in your daily life, how you live your life, what you say, the attitudes that you develop, does truth really matter? Or do we just go along Continuing on what we've always done, living our lives as if really God's word really doesn't make any difference. Again, let me quote from that aged sage, Dub McClish, when he says, quote, thus truth, once generally respected and sought above all else, has thereby been cast on history's ash heap by very many of those born from the 1980s to the present, end quote. Truth is on the ash heap in today's society. But in spite of that, truth is still important. Truth today is just as vital as it has ever been. Because first off, God is a God of truth. It's reiterated many times in the scriptures. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. He's God of truth. In the 31st Psalm, in verse 5, Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Again, identified as a God of truth. In Isaiah 65, in verse 16, That he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. He that soweth or sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hid from mine eyes. God is a God of truth, and as such, God cannot lie. It is impossible for him to lie. In Titus 1 and verse 2, Paul says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie hath promised before the world began. And I think it's important to just note that Paul associates the fact that God cannot lie with the hope that we have in eternal life. If it is the case that God can lie, there is absolutely no hope that anyone has of eternal salvation. Why? Because you might do exactly what God says, be obedient to his every command, and then God lie about the whole situation and say, too bad. You're going to hell anyway. If he can lie. The very fact that we have a hope of eternal salvation rests upon the fact that God cannot lie. And by the way, brethren, those individuals who somehow have this idea that, well, at the judgment, God might find a way to save someone who hadn't been obedient to the gospel. If he did, then he's a liar. And he's not worthy of being worshipped and served. And that book we call the Bible is worthless and should be cast into the fire and burned. Hebrew writer also associates the same principle, Hebrews 6 and verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope that is set before us. 
There is a hope that is there that we as Christians have, but it is based upon the fact that God is truth and God cannot lie. And if either one of those ideas are false, then there is no hope set before us. But God's truth then is revealed within the pages of the Bible. As Jesus prayed to the Father, he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Here's the word of God. It is truth. It reveals truth to us. I know what truth is because God has revealed it within the pages of the Bible. Thy word is truth. And being truth and being God's word, it is powerful. David in the introduction used the passage Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Here's God's power to save. That gospel is a powerful gospel, a powerful word because it is truth. James 1 and verse 21, James says, Wherefore laying, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted or the implanted word which is able, notice that word, is able it has the ability to do what? To save your soul. That's power. That has the ability to save us. This is truly God's power of salvation. It's not going to be found in feelings. Not going to be found in men. It's not going to be found in the councils and creeds of denominationalism. It's going to be found within the pages of the New Testament. God's power to save. And that powerful truth is that which is going to judge us on the last day. John 12, verse 48, Jesus says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. And he tells us why in the next couple of verses, because he's not speaking forth out of himself, but out of the Father. It's the Father's word. That all-powerful truth, God's word. And he says, you reject me, you receive not my words, that all-powerful truth is going to judge you in the last day. It's not going to be by the feelings of man, by all of these other things. It's going to be by God's word. Romans 2 and verse 16, Paul would say, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Here's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what's going to judge us. Thus, we also know that that all-powerful word is going to endure. It's going to remain. While skeptics have tried to destroy God's word, even friends, supposed friends of the Bible, have tried to destroy it, God's word remains pure because it is a powerful message that cannot be destroyed. Heaven and earth shall pass away, Jesus says, but my words will not pass away. Thus, on that day of judgment, when we stand before God to give an account of all that we've done, there's going to be the word of God, that truth that we're going to be judged by. But that powerful truth has the power first to purify our sins. That is to save us from past sins. In 1 Peter 1 verses 22 and 23, Peter says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. 
through the Spirit and to an unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. There's that word of God, he says, it is the truth. It's the word of Christ as well. If you go on and read through verse 25, it also calls it the gospel. And it's an incorruptible seed. Five terms that are used for the scriptures, for the Bible. It is the truth, though, that is able to purify our souls, to make us clean, purified. Remember Jesus, and it's been used uh, just about every lesson, I guess, John 8 and verse 31 and 32, when he said to those Jews that believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Here's a freedom from sin that we were, because of sin, yes, separated from God, but we had the stain of sin upon us. It is that word of God, the truth, which is able to purify our souls so that we are no longer stained by sin. We have salvation as a result of purification by the word of God, by the truth. It is that word of God that is implanted into the heart of man that can change him from one who was a servant of Satan to the servant of God. But it also has the power not only to save us from our sins, but to change our lives. As one put it, this is to say we conduct our lives in the realm of the truth. It determines how we think and how we speak and how we act. We walk in the truth. That's a, such an accurate statement. We walk in the truth. It determines the conduct of our lives. It can and does have the power to change our lives. And that's what James is talking about in James 1, starting in verse 21 and going through verse 23, when he says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity, of naughtiness and receive with meekness the ungrafted word which is able to save your souls but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like a man beholding his natural face in the glass well, we can lay apart the sin and the wickedness in which we have lived as a result of what? That word of God that's been planted within our hearts. Because that word of God planted into our hearts is able to change us from that life of sin to life now of righteousness. A life of doing what God wants us to do and living and abiding by his will. It doesn't take a direct operation of the Holy Spirit upon our heart. It doesn't take angels or coming down and guiding us into a right way. It doesn't take visions of a Christ who's on the cross. It takes the word of God being planted into our hearts that instructs us how we are to live and what we are to do. And because God has made us a free moral agent where I can choose to, yes, do wrong. I can choose to live contrary to his life, his uh, will, or I can choose to voluntarily submit myself to the will of the Father and change my life, to change my attitude. John, in writing to the second epistle, says in verses 2 through verse 4, For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be to you and mercy and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found in, of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Father. Here is God's word. 
And John says, I rejoice that your children walking in that commandment of God, walking in the truth. They are living it. The gospel has the power to change the vilest of sinners to one who's living a pure, wholesome, sinless life. And then finally, that powerful word of God is able to give us a home with God in heaven throughout all eternity. In Acts 20th chapter, as Paul is speaking to these Ephesian elders, while he held back nothing that was profitable to them, told them everything they needed to know, he then concludes it in verse 32 by saying, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Here's an inheritance. For who? That one who is faithfully submitting themselves to the will of God and allowed the truth to have its effect in his life. Paul, as he writes 2 Timothy 2, verse 3 and verse 4, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. He wants our salvation, and as a result, he provided the truth, his word for us. And through our obedience to it, we can have that salvation, that eternal home with God in heaven. No wonder Solomon would say, buy the truth and sell it not. While Pilate might have asked the question, what is truth? We know it. We can obey it. We can live it, we can be saved by it, and enjoy heaven's home.